The following program is a production of Truth For The World. Ye servants of God, your master proclaim and publish abroad his wonderful name, the name of victorious, of Jesus sextal. His kingdom is glorious, he rules over all. We're looking at the idea of the rest of God. Ceasing from labor, the idea of rest and God's rest. We're going, to look at, we're going to look at it from a couple of different perspectives here. Starting off with the idea of the creation, where it all begins. The creation, and then subsequently the Sabbath rest. The creation account in Genesis lets us know that God worked on creation for six days and then rested. And in Genesis 2, we read about the uh, creation, the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Now an all-powerful God really may not need rest as we do from exertion from physical activities. Instead, the word rest really may refer to the idea of ceasing from working on a specific thing. Ceasing from working on a specific thing. Notice again verse 2. On the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made. That's what we're talking about, the end of the creation. He rested on the seventh day from what? All the work that he had made, the, the creation. So it isn't that God is incredibly exhausted and can't do a single thing else. What we're talking about is that God ceased from his work and finished his work. Now if we uh, move forward, we see after Genesis 2, 2, we see later in the New Testament, John chapter 5, that even though God rested from the work of creation, he was not into a totality of rest. In other words, it isn't that God never worked again. In fact, in John five seventeen, Jesus says, uh, My Father worketh hitherto. So the idea of working for six days and resting for one, meaning that God ceased from his work of creation, also gives us the idea of the Sabbath. In uh, Exodus chapter 20 is where we read about remembering the Sabbath to keep it holy. The Jews are told, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. The Jews are being told to work for six days, but not work on the seventh. And the next verse continues with that little word for, which means because, or it's a link back to what he previously said. He's just told the Jews, you're going to work six days and then rest on the seventh, and now he's going to tell them why. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Why are the Jews to work for six days and cease their work on the seventh day? Because that's what God did in creation, and they're to match that. They're to mimic that. They're to cease from their work. Well, that's how we got the idea of the Sabbath. It really links in with creation. But there's also other types of rest in history. The Jews were given the law of Moses, including the honoring of the Sabbath, after they were freed from Egypt. After they left Egypt, they were to go to the river Jordan and cross over into Canaan, the promised land. And this land is described as a place of rest. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, reading verses 8 through 10, Ye shall not do after all the things that we do here this day, every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes. For ye are not as yet come to the rest and to the inheritance which the Lord your God giveth you. 
But when ye go over Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God giveth you to inherit, and when he giveth you rest from all your enemies round about, so that ye dwell in safety. So the Jews were given the law of Moses, including honoring the Sabbath, after they left Egypt. And after they left Egypt, they're told they're going to cross over the river Jordan into the land of rest. And again, the idea of rest did not mean that the Israelites would never work again. Because, if, in fact, they had a lot of work to do after they entered the promised land. They had to drive out the people of Canaan. But the land of Canaan would be described as a land of rest. In other words, an end to their wandering, an end to their travels. However, in Numbers 13 through 14, we read that most of the spies that were sent into the land of Canaan came back with a report that Israel would not be able to take over this promised land. Only Joshua and Caleb believed God would give them the land, and because of their unbelief, God would not allow many of the Israelites to enter into that land of rest. Keep that in mind, that's going to come up again later. In Numbers 14, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel which they murmur against me. Say unto them, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from twenty years old and upward, which have murmured against me, doubtless ye shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. Because of unbelief, many of the Israelites would not enter into their land of rest. Later, we also read about the rest of God in Psalm 95. If we read Psalm 95, verses 7 through 11, For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the provocation and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation, and said, It is a people that do err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Now this psalm has been ascribed to David. It was probably written after the Israelites had already been given the land of Canaan. However, it was a call at that time to avoid hardening of the heart as the Israelites did. It's pointing back to the time when the Israelites hardened their heart in the wilderness. It was a call to hear God's voice. So the comparison is made that the people of that day, the day of David, should not become like the Israelites who had hardened their heart and were not able to enter into the rest due to unbelief. It seems that there's more than one place of rest other than the land of Canaan especially when you look at a psalm like this talking about entering into rest or uh, making a comparison saying, today if you will hear his voice, you won't be like those people. But this is being spoken already in the land of Canaan. They're already in the land of Canaan. Notice the last verse of that particular passage. Unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. The psalmist here is already in the land of Canaan. But yet he's calling out and saying, Don't harden your hearts like those people who were in the wilderness. Otherwise you will not enter into God's rest. There's more than one type of rest here. Or there's at least a rest that continues and it's not just the land of Canaan. In fact, we might say there's also a soteriological rest. Soteriology deals with the idea of salvation. Ology, of course, just means the study of something. So soteriology means the study of salvation. But there's also a rest that deals with salvation, spiritual salvation. If we turn to the book of Hebrews, and we'll be looking at Hebrews 3 and 4 and 12 for the next few moments. Hebrews chapter 3, the writer of Hebrews recalls this event of the unbelief of Israelites who were denied entry into God's rest. Those people who murmured and said, we can't go into the land of Canaan and take it over. We just can't do it. Well, they weren't allowed to go in. 
Notice Hebrews 3. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? Who was not able to enter into the rest? Those that didn't believe. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. However, the writer of Hebrews is not writing to his audience just to give them a history lesson. In fact, the writer is making an application of what happened to the Israelites to the people of his day. He's making a modern time application of what happened to the Israelites to the people of his day. In verse 15, notice the quotation of Psalm 95. Remember we read this in Psalm 95? Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. I believe the writer of Hebrews is trying to get a message to the people of his day. Today, if you will not harden your hearts, you will not be like those people who were denied entry into the land of rest. The writer is writing to Christians. He's giving them a message of exhortation. If you notice verses 12 through 14 of chapter 3, Take heed, brethren. Who's he talking to? Christians. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of what? Unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Again, the warning is against the hardening of hearts and the idea of unbelief. Remember, it was the unbelief that led to the Israelites being denied entry into the land of rest. But the writer of Hebrews continues with a warning that the people of his day should not have the same unbelief, lest they too are denied entering into a rest. Look at chapter 4 and verse 1. Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Well, he's talking about his people, his audience, the people he's writing to that day. We too need to fear, he says, lest because we come up short and we are not able to enter into his rest. What rest did the audience of that day have to enter into? I don't think it was the land of Canaan he was talking about anymore. It was the rest of salvation, the promised land of the kingdom of God. In Hebrews 12, verse 28, the writer continues and says, Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Christians receive a kingdom. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. I think the rest that he's pointing to is that rest of salvation, the kingdom of God the promised land of the kingdom. Notice what the writer of Hebrews says that the people of his day did differently from the Israelites. If we look back at chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, he says, Unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So the writer of Hebrews says, we've heard the truth of God. The Israelites heard the truth of God. But what's the difference? They didn't believe it. They didn't have faith. For we which have believed do enter into his rest. Into rest. There's the difference. It's belief. It's faith. Did the Israelites hear what God wanted them to do? And hear what God had said? Well, of course they did. Well, what was the problem? They didn't believe it. The writer of Hebrews says, We have heard the gospel, and we believed it, and therefore we enter into rest. Remember what he said in the Old Testament, I have sworn in my wrath if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. The news didn't profit the Israelites because it wasn't mixed with belief. 
However, the audience of the writer of Hebrews did believe, and therefore they would enter into rest. Well, what gospel would have been preached to them? The good news about Jesus Christ. What would have happened when they believed it? They would have become Christians. And those Christians were added to the kingdom of God. Acts 2.47, we read that the Lord added to the church daily the kingdom such as should be saved. Those that were being saved. For Christians, the rest of God is a salvation rest. And it's also an eschatological rest. Eschatology is another word that's got the ology at the end of it, meaning the study of something. But it means the study of end times or end things. Often things uh, questioned under eschatology includes what happens after you die. When will Jesus return? What will happen at the second return of Jesus? In other words, the ending of things. But I believe in Scripture there's also an eschatological rest. There's a salvation rest and an eschatological rest. In reality, the rest of God might be seen as continuing all the way from creation. The writer of Hebrews links the rest of God referenced in Psalm 95, 11, to the rest of God after creation in Genesis 2, 2. Look at this in Hebrews 4, verses 3 and 4. Again, the writer of Hebrews is referencing Psalm 95, but he's also referencing the creation in Genesis 2. For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest... Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. It seems that the rest of God at creation is linked with the rest mentioned to the Israelites. Then the Hebrews writer links the rest of God to those in his day by saying, We which have believed do enter into rest. The point being that the rest of God might be seen continuing all the way from creation. That God rested on the seventh day and that rest was always there. In Hebrews 4, 8, it's referenced, If Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken afterward of another day. Well, wasn't Joshua the one who led them into the promised land? If that's the case, why did he speak about another day? They were already in the land of rest. But why was Joshua talking about something to come later? Daniel Fletcher stated in an article that he wrote that God's promise of rest to humanity has been available since the creation. And I think there's good scripture to back that up. God rested from the creation and dwells in heaven. The Jews were to honor the Sabbath day and rest just like God did on the creation. The freed Israelites were to walk through the wilderness until they could enter the promised land of rest. But even in the land of rest in Psalm 95, the author talks about hearing God's voice. And the Hebrews writer links Psalm 95 with the people of his day, exhorting them to hear God's voice and believe. And he states in verse 3 of chapter 4 that those who believe enter into that rest. There's some kind of rest besides the land of Canaan that seems to continually be there. And the writer talks about the rest being more than what we have now. There's an eschatological rest, a rest that's coming at the end of time. In Hebrews 4, 3, we which have believed do enter into rest. You do enter into rest when you believe. But, he states, we who have believed do enter into that rest. But the writer also cautions them, interestingly, in, the previous, uh, in a previous verse, verse 1, about not entering into a rest. You see that? Verse 3 says, when you believe, you enter into rest. But now, in, previously in verse 1, he says, Fear, lest a promise being left of us entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. It's almost confusing, isn't it? How can we enter into rest, but yet still be short of the rest that we could get? Even though they'd already believed, the Hebrews writer is exhorting them to be faithful so they would not miss out on the promised land of rest that is yet to come. 
This might be seen as what has been referred to as the idea of already, not yet, salvation. We are already receiving salvation, or as the Hebrews writer says in verse 3, we are already entering into rest. But we have not yet entered into the full realization of rest. It is not yet fully realized. The rest of God is given to those who believe, but there is a promise of a future rest that can still be missed out on by those who have believed if they choose to become unfaithful. In fact, the Hebrews writer goes on to say in verses 9 and 10, There remaineth therefore a Sabbath rest for the people of God. In verse 3 he says, You enter into rest, but he also says there's another rest coming. Another rest coming. There remains a Sabbath rest. Well, what, is, what was a Sabbath rest? It was time when God ceased from his work. I believe the Hebrews writer is telling us here, you enter into rest, you enter into salvation, but there's another rest coming. A Sabbath rest for the people of God. A time when they will cease from their work. For he that is entered into his rest hath himself also rested from his works as God did from his. As the Bible says, blessed are those who die in the Lord, for they shall, what, rest from their works? Or their works do follow them at least. Isn't that a time when we look forward to to rest from our works? That we work here now and we know that we have the rest of God, the salvation of God, but at the same time we're not fully realized our full rest that's coming later. We have not yet crossed over Jordan into the promised land. There's still something more. That's what we mean by already, but not yet. We are already experiencing some of the rest of God, but we've not yet fully realized the rest that's waiting for us. In Hebrews 4, verse 11, Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Why have we pointed out that so many didn't go into the promised land? Because they didn't believe. And now the Hebrews writer exhorts and says, You keep working. You labor. Yes, you've entered into rest, but your journey is not finished. You keep laboring to enter into that rest unless you fall short after the same example of unbelief. In the great examples of faith, it is told that they did not seek to find a final resting place here on earth. Instead, they looked for something heavenly. If you remember this from Hebrews 11, all those examples of faith, faith, but now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly well, why didn't, why didn't uh, Moses just live in the great palace of Pharaoh? Because he was looking for a better country. Don't you think Moses could have had a lot of rest in the, in the palace of Pharaoh? Yeah, but he wanted a heavenly rest. He wanted a better rest. Daniel Fletcher also wrote, Throughout the Old Testament, the word rest is used both for God's resting place in the promised land and for God's sanctuary. In other Old Testament passages, the resting place of the people and of God are combined so that the resting place of God is also the resting place of the people. The fundamental idea of rest in the Old Testament seems to indicate that it is primarily associated with the presence of God. What kind of rest are we really looking forward to? A rest where we can be with God. Isn't that the problem that started it all in the first place in the Garden of Eden? We sinned and we were separated from God. What have we been trying to do all this time? Get back to God. Get back to the presence of God. As we look for an eschatological resting place, it makes sense to think that the final resting place will also be in the presence of God. Perhaps this has been the idea from the beginning. The place of rest will be where man and God can be together in God's dwelling place of heaven. Where did God rest after the seventh day? On the seventh day, where did he rest? He was in heaven. Where has he always wanted man to come and be with him? In heaven. All throughout the rest of history, 
It's been working to get man back into the place where God is, into the resting place with God. That rest has been there since creation. And we've just been trying to get back to it. In conclusions, God dwells in heaven and his place of rest after creation is in heaven. And God seems to have had a continual promise of rest to humanity. But it was never meant to be this temporarily holy land, so to speak, in Canaan. It was never meant to be this particular piece of dirt over here. The ultimate resting place for man was always to be in the presence of God in heaven. But, as we have learned from the Israelites, that key lesson that keeps getting repeated through Psalm and through Hebrews, you don't enter into the land of rest if you don't believe the word of God. The Hebrews writer is trying to exhort, he's trying to build up his readers to continue working, continue believing, lest you are not able to enter that land of rest. Keep working, keep believing. No matter what happens, try to enter that final place of rest and don't come up short. I think that's a good lesson for us today. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. If you would like a free Bible correspondence course, then write us at Truth for the World, P.O. Box 241, Bethel Springs, Tennessee, 38315, the United States of America or visit us online at truthfortheworld.org. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 16, Jesus says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, Peter told the crowd to repent and be baptized. Did you notice the simple conjunction and? You remember conjunctions from English class, right? It's that simple little word that joins two or more things together. You probably use it all the time. When you order food, you might say, give me steak and potatoes. When you ask for dry cleaning, you might say, clean the pants and the jacket. We know what the word and means. We use it all the time. But so many will argue strongly that baptism is not necessary for salvation or that the Bible does not say baptism is necessary. I wonder what those people would say if the waiter just brought them the potatoes or the dry cleaner just cleaned the pants. Would they argue about the use of the word and? If you would like a free Bible correspondence course, then write us at Truth for the World or visit us online at truthfortheworld.org. Paul said, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Truth for the World is committed to sowing the seed as much as we can. Our Bible teaching goes on day and night and reaches into countries around the world. Students take correspondence courses, listen to our radio programs, watch our videos, and register at our Bible college. We're blessed to be able to be doing so much, but we can't do it alone. If you're a member of the Church of Christ, can you help us? Any prayers and financial support are welcomed. Join us. If we do our part, God will surely do His.